Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Maya, for that wonderful uh, piano there. I was feeling the urge to play the air piano along with you there. That was great. Uh, I also want to say my grandparents are here this morning. They're sitting up here in the, in the front row. I'll embarrass them a little bit. Um, and they've actually been good friends of uh, Pastor Gary for a very long time. Uh, and actually, it's interesting because it, it's, I think it's been healthy for me to have them here because um, Pastor Gary has such youthful vigor and energy in his life. Um, sometimes I forget how uh, old he is until, <laughs> until my grandparents come and say, oh, we've known him for so long. But uh, you. eh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> more, on that, more on that to come. No, I... Uh, <laughs> well, I know this is a, a, a Sabbath morning church service, but it is, if you missed the announcement earlier, we are in the midst of our 10 days of prayer uh, program that we're doing here. Uh, it's a time for us to uh, recognize that not only are we at the start of just another year, but we have lots of things uh, coming up. Uh, things in this church, things uh, in our community, things in our world. And so we want to take the time to start off this year with prayer. And the theme for this week, uh, this 10 days of prayer, is that we are looking at different parables of Jesus, different stories of Jesus. And one thing about stories that um, uh, it's kind of common sense, but we all know that good stories have good characters in them. Good stories have good characters in them. It doesn't take a literary genius to know this. We as humans, we feel more engaged with a story when we understand, we connect with, we relate to, we can empathize with the characters in the story. And the best authors and writers, they understand this. If you've ever read a good novel, you know that it takes time to develop good characters that your readers will become attached to. And the, the greatest authors, they find ways to engage you in the story early, to, to hook you, to reel you in so that they can have time to develop the characters and to get you attached to them and connected to them and uh, by way of that invested in their story. And again, this isn't rocket science for literature here. Uh, think of your favorite movie. I was just recently re-watching It's a Wonderful Life for the hundredth time. Uh, it's about that time of year to, to re-watch that. And I'm always amazed how in such a short time uh, I become so emotional at the end. Uh, I was watching it with my mom, actually, and uh, I was glad my dad wasn't there because I was able to wipe away some, some, some tears at the end of it. Um, it's, it's an emotional ending to the movie, and it's, it's interesting to me that it makes me emotional because it's not a long movie. It, it doesn't have the luxury of uh, maybe your favorite TV show where there's time to uh, develop characters and to develop stories. Um, maybe your favorite book series. Um, there's time to develop those characters and to get invested. But in just a short amount of time, you get connected to George Bailey. You want what's best for him, for his family, and for his town. So while it does take time to develop characters to make good stories, it is possible for the great authors, for the great storytellers to once in a while do something special in just a short amount of time. And if there's one thing that we know about Jesus, and that probably actually most of the world could agree on when it comes to Jesus, it's that Jesus was a great storyteller. Jesus was the great storyteller, is probably how I would say it. The, the reason that the parables of Jesus hold so much weight for us today is because they were told in ways that the people then and now could relate to. Characters that we could empathize with, that we could understand their situation, the choices that they made. We could see not just a good analogy from the story, but we could get invested in the stories of Jesus. And one of the greatest 
parables ever told of Jesus is what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be looking at the story of the prodigal son. In just 22 verses, Jesus masterfully creates a novelette with a focus on just three characters, two of whom we'll be focusing on this morning. The prodigal son reads like the synopsis of a great novel. As you listen to and read the words of Jesus, you, f- you find yourself filling in the gaps of time with the adventures had, the emotions experienced, and the pain endured. If you allow yourself time to connect with and to understand each character in this story, you will find yourself invested as though you have been reading a book series a great novel written by Jesus that you have been eagerly turning the pages of. As he does all of this, he focuses just on three individuals, a father and two sons, one older and one younger. And this morning, we're going to be looking at and focusing on the two sons. So first, let's talk about the younger son, the prodigal son. This is who we focus on the most This is the main character of the story, right? This is who we have named the parable after. It's the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the younger son. But did you know that in the 22 verses of this parable, the prodigal's story of leaving, becoming miserable, and eventually returning to his father's house takes up less than half of those verses. Actually, just about half if you include the dialogue that he has with his father. The prodigal son is who we focus on, who we place ourselves in the shoes of, and yet there is much more to this story than simply the story of a son who leaves returns. Nevertheless, the prodigal younger brother is a powerful character of Jesus' creation whom we can all relate to in some way or another. In Luke 15, verse 11, Jesus begins his story by saying, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now this may just seem like the casual opener of uh, the story, the parable that we're about to read, but I, I don't want us to miss the insane offense that has just taken place here. This isn't just a semi-dramatic opening to, to tell you, okay, this happened and then therefore the rest of the story happened. This is already piping hot, spicy drama here. In a Western society, we are often focused on individuals, so it's easy for us to miss this. But uh, in a more communal cultural uh, setting, This is an earth-shattering statement that has already taken place here. Dr. Kenneth Bailey, a a minister, a professor, and a theologian who focuses on Middle Eastern and New Testament studies, he wrote a book in the 1980s entitled Poet and Peasant and Through Peasant's Eyes, where he dives into the parables of the Gospel of Luke to provide some cultural context and perspective. Bailey writes this, The prodigal's actions are all the more remarkable because his request is twofold. One, he requests the division of the inheritance. His request is granted. But this gives him ownership without the right to dispose of his share. The property is his, it's labeled as his, but he cannot sell it. He can't do anything with it. So he pressures the father into granting him full disposition immediately. Now, in the Mishnah, which is basically the ancient Hebrew collection of oral traditions and laws that we have, um, it's actually uh, really interesting to look at this because, um, you know, if you're wanting to know the cultural context, and Bailey writes about this, you might look at what the the traditions and the law books would say concerning this matter. And it's interesting because the Mishnah 
does seem to allow for very special circumstances where a father can sign over the inheritance to his son early before his death, but only by the father's choice and for reasons of love, protection, and precaution, not because of pressure from the son to the father. Bailey continues to say that the son's request to not only divide the inheritance, but to also receive it now, is not only not within his rights to ask as the son, but it also underlies the implication, Father, I cannot wait for you to die. You see, the son at the beginning of the story, he isn't just bold. He isn't just a little disrespectful. He isn't just foolish to ask for his inheritance now. He is downright horrible, disrespectful, and an awful son. When, this, when we read the story of the prodigal son, we often think of the graciousness of the father at the end of the story, when the, the son comes home and the father runs out and forgives him. But the father is already gracious by even allowing him to have his inheritance in this way in the first place. Victor's going to be talking more about the, the character of the father this evening at our session this evening. So I invite you to come to that because that'll be very, very good to dive into that more. But for the youngest son, he doesn't just leave. He knowingly brings shame upon his family. He burns all the bridges. He takes what his father worked for his entire life to give to his son. And he walks away without looking back. And here's where the story begins to feel a little bit more like a great novel that we are just getting a little summary of. We're just getting bits and pieces of it. Because the son leaves, he goes and he finds people to feed into his desires, and he lives it up. He lives it up. And this is where I think probably most of us will fill in the gaps and will say, oh, if that was me, if I all of a sudden had a lot of money, I had no responsibilities. Um, I could do whatever I want. I had made the choice to leave home and go live it up. You know what you would do in that situation. You know how you would live it up. You know what you would probably do if you weren't being smart and you just wanted to get rid of your money and to have fun. He leaves his father's house. He goes to the city. He lives it up with no thought of the future. But as it eventually does for everyone, the future comes. The future hits, and when it hits, he loses everything. Not only does he lose his money and his inheritance, his resources and his friends, but also the story says that there's a famine in the land so he can't even rely on the generosity of others to take care of him, even if there was someone he knew who was generous enough to take care of him. He eventually finds work feeding pigs, and he is so, so down bad that he looks at what he's giving the pigs, and he is hungry for the slop. He looks at what he's feeding the pigs, and he says, man... That is some fine dining right there. If he had a phone, maybe he would have posted a pic to Instagram and said, here's my meal for the day. Maybe he wouldn't have. We don't know how, how, how <laughs> public he was or if he would have had any followers at that point. But Have you ever just had an experience in your life where you just sat and you looked around and you said to yourself, I might have a problem. Uh, you looked around and m maybe it was something serious. Maybe it was something like an addiction or something that you were struggling with. And there was a moment in time that you said, okay, this is, this is serious. I need to take this seriously. I need to turn some things around. Or maybe you were just sitting in the same recliner watching NFL Red Zone for five hours and you realized, I didn't start any of that yard work I promised I'd do today. I probably should get out of here and go do something. Uh, whatever it is, however serious or not, we've all had those times in life where we sat and we looked around and we said to ourselves, something is, something's wrong here. 
We need something to change. And that's what happens to the son here. He, he's lost his resources, his wealth, his pride, his dignity. And now he's staring at his reflection in a pool of mud and pig feed. And he realizes that he is unrecognizable as his father's son. The son realized that even if he went home, no one would recognize him as his father's son anymore. But crucially, he realized something else. He realized that although he was no longer recognizable as his father's child, he was still his father's child. Even though nobody would look at him and say, oh, that's your father's child. He knew that at his core, he still was his father's child. So he drafts up a proposal to make to his father, and he decides to head home. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is what it says in Luke 15. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants are mo have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He drafts up this proposal, a speech to make to his father to ask for forgiveness. He knows he's brought shame upon his family. He knows he's burnt all the bridges at home. But he says, you know what, I am still a son and I want to return home and see if anything can be better for me there. In his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, Henry Nguyen writes this, whatever he had lost, be it his money, his friends, his reputation, his self-respect, his inner joy and peace, one or all, he remained his father's child. With these words in his heart, talking about the proposal that he had drafted up, the speech that he made, with these words in his heart, he was able to turn to leave the foreign country and to go home. He was able to turn to leave the foreign country and to go home. You see, while we realize often that the decision to come home was not easy for the younger son, it was not an easy decision to go home when things were a little awkward. He knew things would be a little awkward, maybe a little more than awkward when he arrived home. But what I want us to catch this morning is that the only reason that decision to return home was even possible in the first place was because he realized who he was at his core. Do you know who you are at your core this morning? Do you believe that you are a child of God? That the gracious Father who loved you before you left home will love you the same when you return and he will embrace you with open arms. Because that's what Jesus says the Father does. He says in Luke 15 verse 20, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. Before the son could even start to stutter or stammer out his speech about, I'm so sorry, Father, and I promise I'll change and I'll accept whatever judgment you have for me. Before he could even begin that speech, his father erased his fear with acts of love to run to him, to embrace him, and to forgive him. If you feel lost this morning, just remember if you feel that you are trying to find the right words, the right way, the right time to return home to Jesus, remember that he is always already waiting for you with open arms. But there is another character in this story because Jesus told us at the beginning that the man had two sons. There is an older brother. And if we were to fill in some of the gaps for this novel about this character, Jesus tells us briefly, this older brother, this was the good son. This was the son that did everything right. This was the son who grew up in church. This was the son who was always dressed and ready for church on time, Sabbath morning. 
He never complained about having to sit next to his parents in the pew during the service. He studied. He did his own personal devotions. He did the work that his father asked him to. He had a genuine relationship with his father. The older brother was the one that did everything right. And I wonder, I wonder how many of this, us this morning would truly identify more with the older brother than the prodigal son. You see, we love the story of the prodigal son because it is a story of hope, a story of redemption, and a story of love. And because we have all fallen short, we have all sinned, we can all identify with the prodigal son in some regard or another. But maybe, maybe you've lived a good life. You have believed in God since you were a child. You were baptized young. You never left the church. You maintained a, a healthy diet. You faithfully read your Bible. You pray for yourself and others continually. While you may not be perfect, you know that you have never truly left to a foreign country. You have never completely turned your back on God. And this shouldn't be a, a source of shame. This should be a, a source of pride. It's a good thing to walk down good paths in life. But how do you feel when you hear someone else's testimony? Do you ever feel that you never got to be celebrated because you always were faithful? And I'm not talking about what we would say outwardly, because obviously outwardly we, we would celebrate, and we would never feel bitterness um, in, in church or outwardly. But I'm talking about how you feel in your heart, at your core. Because when the older son is angry uh, about that his younger brother, the prodigal son, is being celebrated, he doesn't go into the party. He doesn't stand up in church and say, are, are we seriously going to celebrate this person? They did so many things wrong. You wouldn't stand up in church and say, are, are we really going to celebrate that this person has come back home? But when the brother has the conversation, he has the, the conversation with his father, one-on-one, -on -one, in private. How come heaven doesn't throw a party when you choose to make a good decision yet again? Does the party only happen if you do a bunch of wrong things and then just choose to do a right thing? Or maybe, maybe you do feel joy when people come home or come to Christ, but you struggle with your struggles. You struggle with why you struggle. Because you hear people tell stories of the miracles God performed for them. The miracles of how he brought them back home to him. But you do everything right, and you don't have a story to compare. So although you maintain your relationship with your father, you come to church, you do the right things, you, you can't help but feel some bitterness and resentment when you sing on a Sabbath morning and you praise God for all that he has done for you. Whatever your bitterness, you feel that you've tried to do everything right, but something just isn't lining up with the results. You walked the path that God asked you to, but you feel disappointed as to where you have come thus far. In the same way that the younger son, the prodigal son, walked down a path and said, I need to turn around, something's wrong here. The me who I was 20 years ago wouldn't recognize me now. You have also walked down a path. You've walked down a good path. But now you're looking at your surroundings and you're saying, am I really that much better off? If you feel any connection to the old, older brother, I have very good news for you. Because do you remember the beauty of how the father ran to the prodigal son? It's an emotional moment. It's a moment that we recognize that, again, this father is not very concerned with the shame he's going to bring on himself. 
he recognizes whatever that shame is, it doesn't matter because his son is coming home and he runs out to meet his son. And so if you are an older brother, you feel you connect with that in some way, um, you may feel that God doesn't want to run to you the same way. But believe it or not, the father does run to meet the older brother. Well, maybe not runs. He, he, he more walks out of the party. But he, he does come out to meet the brother, the older brother. And believe it or not, again, talking about the shame in this culture, it was a shameful act for the father to leave the party, his own party, and to go out and see the older brother. The older brother should have come in and voiced his, his, his feelings there. The father didn't have any responsibility to say anything or to do anything about that. But once again, he says, I'm not worried about that shame. I care about my son. I want to go out there and see what's wrong with my, with my child. The father leaves the party to meet the older brother where he is at. The same way that he left the comfort and the safety of his home to run to the prodigal. The father listens to the older son. He understands him. He encourages him. He reassures him. And he still invites him into the celebration. You know, we don't get to know how the older brother responds to the invitation. But I do think that's intentional. You see, Jesus calls us to choose him, to choose a relationship with the Father. It doesn't matter if you've never known him before, if you only knew him when you were young, or if you've known him all your life. God loves you, and he calls you his child now, today. The younger son chose to come to the Father out of desperation, out of a necessity. But the Father still took him in and loved him. The older son stayed with the Father. He didn't leave to a foreign country, but he also didn't need to come into the party because the Father gave him the choice to choose to, and he came to him, he took him in, and he loved him. If you feel today that you have been a prodigal son, God loves you. If you feel today that you are an elder child, God loves you. It is possible for all of us to be prodigals. It is possible for all of us to feel we do everything right. What kind of child you are, at the end of the day, it's irrelevant. What matters is that you realize that you are a child of God. God loves you. No matter how far away you roam, there is always a home for you in the arms of Jesus. Why do you think God sent Jesus to die for our sins? Do you think he just felt a little sorry for us? Do you think he felt bad that we were stuck in this whole sin thing and he thought, oh, I'll just help him out because I feel like it today? No. Jesus came lived and walked among us, died and rose again simply because there is a Father in heaven who wants you to know he loves you and that you are always welcome home. Are you feeling desperate this morning? Are you feeling in need of a home, in need of love? God is your home. God is your love. Are you feeling that you've heard this before, that you've given to God and you're waiting for a return on investment. Well, I have news for you. God is reminding you this morning that he already gave the return before you even invested. He gave you his son, and he is still continually giving you unending, unwavering love. So how will we respond this morning? Wherever you are, wherever we are, spiritually, mentally, or physically, remember, let us remember that we have a home, that we have a father, and that we are loved. Amen.